You are welcome to my channel. Today we are going to learn how to prepare payroll account in Excel. Um, this payroll accounting is going to be prepared based on how it works in Ghana. There are certain uh, laws that we will apply what is pertaining in Ghana. For instance, when it comes to the computation of income tax, and as well as the social security contribution, these two are issues that we need to apply the Ghana st standard. Um, at the end of every month, employers are expected to pay employees their salaries. <clears throat> so the account that is required to be prepared to show the distribution of salaries among employees is what you call the payroll. Now, every organization has its own concept for paying employees. And for that matter, there is no standard way of preparing payroll. So we are going to take a particular case study and see how the payroll could be prepared from that case study. This is the case study. See the following data relate to I told you limited for the month of June 2020. We have the data about the employees in the company. We have their ID, their SNIT numbers, their names, their grade, the levels and the number of days each employee worked within the month. Below the table, we are told that the basic salary of the company is based on the following pay levels. So this is the level within the organization that any employee could be placed in the corresponding basic salary. There we have some taxable allowances also to be enjoyed by employees. These include rent allowance, risk allowance, TNT allowance. Besides the allowances, we also have some deductions to be taken from the employee's income. These deductions include social security contribution. Uh, we also have union dues, we have provident fund, and then we have income tax. So based on this, we are going to see how payroll for this company for the month of June 2020 could be prepared. So moving the data here into Excel, it shall look like this. When it comes into the Excel sheet, <clears throat> we will have this particular data. Within this data, we can add our payroll, or we can add certain columns to generate the full payroll account. In the course of preparing payroll, beside the data about the employees that you, you present, the first thing that we need to take into consideration is what we refer to as the basic salary. So in column G, we shall take our basic salary the basic salary appears in column G. Now, after the basic salary, then all allowances will have to be stated. Per the case study we are solving right now, the allowances that we have include rent allowance, risk allowance, and then TNT allowance. So these were the allowances that we have for this particular case study. Now, after the allowances, we add up the basic and the allowances, and this results in what you call the gross salary. So basic salary plus all allowances will give us what you call the gross salary. Now, in every payroll, you know, income tax is one of the deductions that we consider in preparation of payroll. 
and income tax is computed or is calculated on what you call the chargeable income. So before we even go ahead to list our deductions, I normally state the chargeable income right after the gross salary. So over here, the chargeable income will be stated. So I have my chargeable income in this column. Now, after the chargeable income, then I need to list all the, all the deductions. Per the case study we are addressing now, the deductions available include uh, Social Security Fund, SSF, So we have this SSF, we have union dues, we have provident fund, and then we have the income tax. So these are the available deductions in this question. Then after the deductions, we will have to total them. So we get the total deductions. So total deductions, also appear in the next column. Then finally, the net salary will come. So we have the net salary also coming after the uh, total deductions. Right. So based on the case study and the review, this is the structure of our payroll. Uh, in order for us to be more efficient, <clears throat> in order not to be dragging formulas, we are going to create, or we are going to work the payroll in a table. So I'll create a table for this particular payroll, right? I'll create a table for this payroll. Now, according to the question, the basic salary for the employees are based on some levels. So the level the employee is placed determines how much salary should be given to the employee. So I would like to stitch all the levels with their, with their basic salaries in a particular sheet. So when I go, go into the, uh, the workbook containing my payroll, I will have to add a new worksheet where I will set up the levels with their basic salaries, okay? So the levels and the salaries are also captured here. So any employee who is placed under 20H as a level is entitled to a salary of um, 25,000. Okay, so we are going to see how we can set up the sheet so that um, when you change the level for the employee as we have here, the system automatically record the basic salary for that person. The function that you are going to use to do this <coughs> is the VLOOKUP function that we are already aware of, the VLOOKUP function that we know already. So because we need the VLOOKUP function, I will have to create a table for this level and their salaries. So I'll create a table here, sorry. I'll create a table, control plus T, and then this table shall be labeled as salary. So I name the table as salary. Now at this stage, what I can do is to move to the payroll and provide the VLOOKUP function under the basic salary to give us the base life for all the employees based on the level each employee is placed. To do this, <clears throat> we start with the equal sign and then the VLOOKUP. The lookup value is going to be the level because it is the level that will determine the basic salary for the employee. And here, the level for the first person is in cell E2. So I will put in E2 inside the bracket. And this represents the lookup value. 
after this comma table array the table is a table that contains all the levels in the organization with their basic salaries which we have just named it as salary so the, the recent table we created that we named it as salary is going to be used as a table array so my table is called salary so i select the salary table here then comma then the column index number within the salary table the basic salary that i am looking for is within the second column so its index number is two then comma now i want the exact match for each level so i go for exact match and then close the bracket so when i finish i hit enter key and you see it has given me the basic salary for all the employees depending on the level each employee is placed i'll only have to format the column so that it i present the values as accounting values right <clears throat> now <clears throat> back to the question rent allowance according to the question rent allowance is five percent of basic salary for all employees so if every employee is, is entitled to five percent of his or her basic salary then we shall compute it as this equal to five percent multiplied by the basic salary for the first person the basic salary is in cell g2 so i will type g2 so five percent multiplied by g2 will give me the the rent allowance for the employee then i enter right so this has given us the rent allowance for all the employees the risk allowance per the question it says that there is risk allowance of one percent of the basic salary plus 25 cities for each day worked one percent of the basic salary plus 25 cities for each day worked so here uh, we are going to have two separate computations the first one is one percent times the basic salary which is g2 so i decided to put this in a bracket to, representing the first part of the computation then plus the second part says that 25 cities for each day work so that is going to be 25 multiplied by the number of days worked and this number of days worked is in cell f2 so 25 multiplied by f2 so this is how the risk allowance for this company is paid one percent of basic salary plus 25 cities for each day work then i enter going to the tnt see there is tnt allowance of 10 cities for each day work so each day you 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 come to work you are entitled to tnt allowance of 10 cities so depending on the number of days you work then we can have your total allowance for tnt so tnt allowance is also going to be 10 cities multiplied by the number of days worked and this is f2 so 10 cities or 10 multiplied by f2 will give us the tnt allowance so i accept this and then format the column to give me values in accounting then the gross salary <clears throat> with the gross salary we sum up from the basic to all the allowances so the basic plus all allowances will give us the gross salary to do this we can highlight from the basic salary true to the gross salary we highlight from the basic up to the gross salary so that with this we can use the auto sum auto sum is at home so from home you see the auto sum here so when you click on the auto sum we expect that this will give us the gross salary for all the employees instead of using the auto sum you know the formula that we could have used is equal to sum 
bracket F2 colon J2. So this, sorry, there is a mistake here. The gross salary does not include the F. So, and I could see that the system added the F. So I will have to uh, redo it. This one should start from the basic to the gross salary. Right, so I have gotten the correct value for the gross salary. The gross salary is supposed to be basic salary plus the rent allowance, plus the risk, and plus the TNT. So it is supposed to be G2 colon G2, not to start from F. This is not part of the payment, right? So the payment starts from the basic salary up to the TNT. So we've gotten our gross salary. Now, to compute for chargeable income, I would like to talk about social security contribution in Ghana. In Ghana, every employee is expected to have 18.5% of his or her basic salary to be deposited into his pension scheme or to be deposited towards his pension. Out of this 18.5%, the employee himself pays 5.5%, while the employer adds um, the employer adds 13% to it. So the employee's contribution of 5.5% is what we classify as part of the deductions from the employee's income. So the SSF we have here is the employee's contribution of 5.5%. The employer's contribution is not part of the employee's deduction. So what we normally do is that we state that after the total deduction. So right after this total deduction, I'm going to state 13% SSF. This is what the employer has to add to the 5.5% contributed by the employee. So that at the end, the employee will have the total of 18.5% to be deposited to his account. <clears throat> now in Ghana, some time ago, the whole of this 18.5 was managed by SNIT. Until recently that we, there is an introduction of three-tier pension scheme. So the three-tier pension scheme is operating under this concept. Now, there is what you call tier one, and tier one is 13%, 13.5%. 13 tier one is 13.5%. This 13.5% is coming from the 18.5. So what people even say is that the tier one is made up of the employer's contribution plus 0.5 contribution 0.5% contribution from the employee. So this gives us 13.5%. This tier one is what is managed by SNIT. So SNIT is currently managing 13.5% towards employees' pension. Then tier two. Tier two is the remaining 5% from the employee's contribution. This is managed by private fund managers. And these private fund managers, uh, they are firms specialized in managing funds for people. So for this, the employee association themselves who identify a firm that they wish or they want to manage their 5% their, their for them. So the tier two 5%, is also towards the employee's pension. But this time, it is not managed by SNIT. So it means two separate entities are managing the 18.5%. The third tier, which we call the provident fund. So tier three, we have tier three, and tier three is provident fund. Right. <clears throat> provident fund, unlike the social security fund, is not mandatory deduction. Because in Ghana, not every organization is even having the provident fund scheme. 
So it is not mandatory for all employers to deduct money towards provident fund, provided the employees themselves, together with the employers, decide to establish that scheme for the benefit of the members towards their pension. And even if that scheme is established, it cannot be compulsory for every staff. So this is not a compulsory or mandatory deduction. But any organization that is operating with provident fund, that has established provident fund scheme, that when it comes to the computation of income tax, employees enjoy some tax relief from it. And the tax relief employees could enjoy from this provident fund is up to a maximum of 16.5%. So the provident fund that attracts tax relief is 16.5%. So that means that if the provident fund deduction from an employee is either equal or less than this 16.5%, then it means the whole sum shall not be taxable. But if it tends to exceed the 16.5%, then only 16.5% shall not be taxable, while the remaining shall be taxable. So in the course of computing the uh, chargeable income for an employee, if there is provident fund, then we need to look at the rate of the provident fund. If the rate for the provident fund is 16.5% or less, then the whole value of the provident fund shall be deducted from the gross salary. In addition to the employee's contribution of social security fund, which is 5.5%. So the 5.5% social, social security fund contributed by the employee is non-taxable. So this has to be taken from the gross income. If there is any provident fund, the provident fund, if it is not less than, if it is not more than 16.5, then the whole sum will not be taxable. But if it tends to exceed 16.5, then only 16.5% shall not be taxable. So in this our payroll, you find out that the provident fund is in cell column O. A social security fund is in M. Gross salary is in K. So to compute for chargeable income, we can say that K6 minus M6, which represent the 5.5% the, the social security contribution, minus O6, that represent the provident fund. And this formula is accepted, provided the, the provident fund, if the provident fund is less or equal to 16.5%. So at any time, provident fund tends to be lesser or equal to 16.5% of the basic salary, then the chargeable income shall be calculated as gross salary minus social security fund minus provident fund. But on the other hand, if the provident fund should go beyond 16.5%, then the formula has to be K6 minus M6 minus, then we compute 16.5% of the basic salary. So a situation where the provident fund tends to exceed 16.5%, then the computation of the, the chargeable income will now be like this. In that case, we will not deduct the whole provident fund value because the whole value for provident fund exceeds 16.5%. So in, what we have to do is to work out 16.5% of the basic, and that is what is not taxable. So in this case study, our provident fund is 10%. And as the provident fund is 10%, then it means that the whole value for provident fund needs to be taken from the gross salary. So our chargeable income is going to be K2 minus M2 minus O2, where K2 represents the gross salary, M2 representing the social security fund, that is the employee's contribution, and O2 representing the provident fund, 
which is just 10%. And therefore, the whole value has to be deducted. So we get the chargeable income. Right. Social security fund and income tax. These two are compulsory deductions and they are mandatory as well, or they are statutory. So in every payroll you prepare in Ghana, these two deductions must always be present. Even if the question under review does not talk about social security fund and income tax, remember that you cannot prepare any payroll in Ghana without these two. So in every payroll preparation in Ghana, if it is for Ghanaian business, then social security fund and income tax should compulsory be part of your deductions. Now, I've mentioned that some deductions could be compulsory and examples include the social security fund, union dues and income tax. You know, union dues is also compulsory because if you're employed in an organization and there, there is a policy that you should be part of a union or maybe within the organization there is welfare, that is compulsory. So welfare dues becomes compulsory. Union dues become compulsory. You cannot say you will be a worker or an employee there, but you will not pay for that particular dues. It is compulsory, but not all compulsory deductions are statutory. So within the compulsory deductions, we can have non-statutory deductions, and we can also have statutory deductions. So the statutory deductions here could include social security fund and the income tax. The non-statutory deductions, they may be compulsory or right, but they are non-statutory. And examples include union dues, welfare dues, and others. Okay, provident fund. Okay, these are non-statutory. Um, when we say deduction is statutory, when it is backed by law, that if you fail to deduct as an empl employer, you could be prosecuted to answer questions why you fail to deduct such money from employees' income. In Ghana, employers are mandated to deduct social security fund and income tax. So if you fail to deduct as an employer, you should prepare to face the law to answer questions. So that makes these deductions statutory, right? The non-statutory ones, if an employer fails to deduct, I don't think that it could, it could lead to court. Okay, this one could be settled within, right? But if you fail to deduct social security fund and income tax, then an employer could find himself or herself in the law court. So this makes the two statutory deductions. All right, so social security fund contribution from employee has always been 5.5%, okay, for, for so long a period. So this is going to be 5.5% of the basic salary. So we work out equal to 5.5% multiply by G2. Remember that G2 is the basic salary. So we work out 5.5% out of it, and that will give us a social security fund. Union dues. Per this question, every employee is, 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 is to contribute 15 cities, so 15 cities deduction, 15 cities. So I'm making it equal to 15 so that it, it will fail for all the employees. Remember, if you are working in a table, every formula you type for one person affect the rest. So if you make it equal to 15, this is going to affect the rest. Okay, then I format to give me accounting values. The provident fund, according to this case study, is 10% of the basic salary. So this is going to be equal to 10% right? Multiply by G2, which is the basic salary. So 10% times G2 will give us the provident fund. All right. Let me clear this side. It's not part of the work. It, I, get, I only created it for explanation purpose for you. Okay. Now, the income tax. The income tax calculation is going to be based on the pay as you earn system in Ghana. So as for this, I'll skip it for now and return back to it later on. So I'm going to compute my total deductions. Total deductions will sum from the social security fund up to the income tax. So because I, I'm, I want to use the auto sum, 
I will need to highlight to the total deductions where I want the output to appear. I want the output to appear in the total deduction. So that is where I should extend the selection to. Then I click on this autosum, right? So when I click on the autosum, see I have gotten my total deductions for all the employees. The 13% social security fund is also calculated on the basis salary. So 13% times J2 will give me the employer's contribution. Sorry, I didn't add the percentage. You see the outcome now. So I get the employer's contribution of the social security. Then the net salary. Net salary is simply the gross salary minus the total deductions. So this is equal to my gross salary is at K2 minus the total deductions, which is at Q2. So K2 minus Q2 give me the net salary. Then I accept this. Okay. So, so far, without the income tax computation, this is where we've got into. Now, I'm going to show you how we can calculate the income tax. You know, with the pay as you earn table, it keeps updating. The Internal Revenue Authority keeps updating the, the, the pay as you earn table. So I would like to uh, show the calculation with you using the prevailing one, the one that came just in the, uh, the, the January 2020. And as of today, which is uh, July 12th, that has been the same uh, tax rate in Ghana, operating in Ghana. So I'm going to uh, apply the same rate in this particular case study. That Okay, so according to the case study, this is the prevailing tax rate. So we shall see how this uh, table could be used to calculate the income tax for all the employees. Now, some people, what they do is that when it, they get the income tax side, they calculate it manually. For instance, they pick each staff, look at the, the total chargeable income, then come and determine where the person is falling, whether the person falls under the first rule, the second, third, fourth, fourth, fifth, or sixth. They look at where you belong, and based on that, they will calculate your income tax, then they go and type it inside. Now, this is the interpretation to the, of the table. This, this is how the table is explained. Per the table, any employee who is earning 319 or below is not supposed to pay tax. So it means that the, 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 the cumulative tax is, is going to be zero, right? It's not only for those who are earning 319 or below, but any income, if, you are, if, you, if your chargeable income is more than that, then the first 319 is, is free, is tax free. So within the, within, no matter the income you have, the first 319, you don't pay any tax on it. Okay. The second line says, if your income that does not exceed 419, if your cumulative chargeable income does not go beyond 419, then you must pay tax of the difference between the income which is not beyond the 419 and the tax-free component. So I say this because should my cumulative chargeable income be 400, then the tax I must pay is supposed to be the 400, which is my cumulative income, minus the tax-free component of 319, then the resulting figure is expected to be multiplied by the tax rate of 5%. You know, here, we say next 100, meaning if you add 100 to 319, that gives you 419, okay? So if your total income is exactly 419, then the difference between the two is 100. And if you work out 5% of the 100, it gives you a tax of five. And so far, the total tax becomes 15. Total tax here, it means tax on this line plus the tax on the previous line. Previous line tax is zero, right? It's nil, so this is zero. So as the previous tax, previous line tax is zero, when you add it to five, we get a total of five. Now, going to the third row, 
if your income is not more than 539, okay, it means if you are able to add 120 to the 419, which gives you 539, then in the, in the difference between your income and the 419, you should tax it at 12%, tax it at 10%, right? But remember that up to the 419, there is total tax of five. So if you are to less the 419 from the 539, before you multiply the difference by the 10%, then you need to add the total tax as at the 419, okay? So for instance, if my income is, let's say 520, okay, 520, remember, let's see how the calculation should be done for income of 520. If my total chargeable income is 520, right, then my computation shall be this. So it means the first uh, 419, okay, 419, is having total tax of five, okay? Now, 520 minus 419, then I multiply this by 10%, okay? So whatever I get has to be added up to the five, right? So to show this computation, let me see. Um, uh, five, 520 minus 419 times 10%, give me 10.1, okay? So the 10.1, has to be added to the five to give me a total tax of 15.1. So with, with, with a chargeable income of 520, my total tax is supposed to be 15.9, 15.1. Okay, but this uh, 539, right? If it is 539, then that is going to be 539 minus 419, giving us 120. And 120 times 10% is 12. 12 plus cumulative, the previous cumulative of five to give us 17. All right, so that is the interpretation of this table. Now, within the payroll we are preparing, I would like to show the, the uh, chargeable income for one of the employees and see how we can do the manual computation. For instance, the first person's chargeable income, which is 4772.5. Let us see how we can perform the manual computation. So the chargeable income is 4772.5. Now this 4772.5, we can find it within the, fee, the fifth rule. You see, because the fourth rule has 3539, which is less than the 4772.5. So with this, I will say that the first 3539 has the total tax of 542, okay? Then, I'll subtract the 3539 from the 4772.5. So 4772.5 minus 3539. And this is to be multiplied by the tax rate on the fifth line, which is 25%. So let us see how much this will be. So we are going to have 4772.5 minus 3539. Okay. And this to be multiplied by 25%. Okay, so multiply by 0.25. And this is 308.38. So we have 308.38.38. And when you add the 542 to it, plus 542, which give us 850.38. So the first person's income tax is expected to be 850.38. Okay, now, how do we, are we to do the calculation one, one, one by one for each employee, then we go and type it. Well, if you can do that, there's nothing wrong with it. But there is a way that you would have to create a formula. You type the formula only once and it will compute the tax for every employee. So that to me is the best way to go. So we are going to create a formula out of this table so that when you put in the formula, the income tax for all the employees shall be calculated. So let us see how the function will go. Remember, income tax is calculated on chargeable income, okay? So because income tax is calculated on chargeable income, then we are going to represent CI for chargeable income. So I say CI equal to chargeable, income, right? CI equals chargeable income. So it means that wherever you come across uh, CI, it is representing 
chargeable income. So now let us see the formula. We build if statement for each line. So I'm going to start from the from the first line. So from the first line, I will say that equal to if C I, all right, equals equals what? No, if C I less than or equal to three one nine. It means if our chargeable income is not exceeding three one nine, and if it is not exceeding, then it could be less than, it could be equal to, all right. Let me increase the font size for, for you so that you can see it well in the screen. Okay. So if your chargeable income is not exceeding 319, according to the first line, tax is zero. According to the first line, tax is zero. This completes the first line, then comma. In the second line, you say that if CI, cumulative chargeable income, is not exceeding, not exceeding 419, comma, how much is tax? We can say tax is five. Because tax is only five when the income is 419. What if it is less than 419? So it means that the income is still unknown figure. So as it is unknown figure, that is the CI, chargeable income, minus the previous one, which is 319. And this is now supposed to be multiplied by 5%. So that means should the income be exactly 419, then it should be 419 minus 319, which will give us 100 before we get 5% of it, which will be five. But if the chargeable income should be something like 418, okay, or any value from 320 up to uh, 4, 418 or 419, then we cannot have exact figure. That is why we are using the CI to represent any income ranging from 320 to 419, okay? Right, so this completes <clears throat> the second line. Now, comma, we move on to the third line. We say that if CI, according to the third line, chargeable income is expected to not to go beyond 539. So if it is not beyond 539, comma, then the computation, bracket, CI minus. So as we are on the third line, then we have to less the value on the second line, which is 419, okay? So minus 419, this, to be multiplied by the tax rate of 10%. Then at this stage, we find out that the 419 we are less in here, it has a total tax of five. So that tax five has to be added, okay? One may ask, why didn't we add anything to the five here? Because the 319 we were deducting has total tax of zero. So that is why we didn't add, okay? But at this stage, the 419 we are deducting has a total tax of five. So we need to add the five, okay? And this completes the third line. So comma. On the fourth line, we have if CI less or equal to, and this is three, five, three, nine. <clears throat> three, five, three, nine, comma. Computation becomes CI minus the five, three, nine. Okay, minus five, three, nine. Mm -hmm. Then bracket close, multiply by the tax rate of 17.5%, right? Then the 539 that we are deducting has a total tax of 17. So that is plus 17. The total tax is the cumulative tax, which is this column. Okay, comma. Then on the, on the fifth line, you see if CI less or equal to 20,000, comma. Then CI minus CI minus the previous one of three five three nine. Okay, multiply by the tax rate. Sorry, multiply by the tax rate of twenty five percent plus the total tax asset the three five three nine. And this is four five four two. So five four two. Now going to the last rule. On the last rule. There is this clause that exceeding. So exceeding becomes if CI greater than 20,000. And if it is greater than 20,000, then CI minus 20,000, okay, multiply by 30%. Then we add the total tax as at the 20,000. And this is 4657.25. So according to the 
tax table we have here, this if statement is capable of computing income tax for every employee. Now, when you finish, because we have six if statements, we need six brackets at the end. So one, two, three, four, five, six. This is going to give us the income tax for every employee. All right, it's going to give us the income tax for every employee. Now, the next stage is to go and type this formula in the Excel. Now, when you go into the Excel, let us go and look at something there. When you go into the Excel, you realize that chargeable income is L, is in column L. Meanwhile, in the formula that we've just learned, the formula that we've just learned, we were using CI to represent the chargeable income, okay? So we cannot type this formula right now in the Excel using the same CI, using the same CI, because CI is not a cell name in the Excel. So what we can do is to look at the cell that contains the chargeable income for the first person, all right? And when you go into the Excel, you realize that the cell that contains the chargeable income for the first person is L, is L what? L2. So the option you have is that within the formula we just, look, we just typed, you will have to uh, replace all your CI by L2. So this place will be L2, L2. Wherever there is CI, it has to be L2, L2, L2. An alternative is that if you want to use the CI as we have in the formula, there is a way out. And the way out is to name the column containing the chargeable income as CI. So if I want to name the column L as CI, right, I'll pick the entire column like this, then click inside the name manager, I mean the name box, and when I go into the name box, I type in the CI there, then I enter to see. So now that I have named this column as CI, then I'm free also to type the CI, right? Because this formula has already been typed in white, I'll go and copy and come and paste it. So when I go to the white, I'll copy the entire formula, okay, including the equal, the, the equal sign that begins. Copy this formula. Then when I go into the Excel, when I come into the Excel, I have to paste it. So you see, I have been able to get my I've gotten my income tax for all the employees. If you remember, the first person, when I calculated his income tax, it was 850.38, you know? That is exactly what I have there. Okay, so this gives us the payroll. At the end of it all, we can decide to find out a total for each column. So starting from the base salary, if I want the total, I'll just pick it up to the next empty row and click on it to get the totals, okay? And i move down to this place. All right, now let, let, let me do some small thing with a table for you. Assuming I want to find out the, 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 the what do you call it, the, 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 the employee with the minimum salary. The employee with the minimum salary. Okay, when I click on this total, okay, and select minimum. The minimum salary someone is taking is 1,673, right? If I want to find out the maximum, okay, the, okay. The maximum salary someone is taking, net salary someone is taking is 17,000, okay? Good. So you can keep having the, how do you call it? Um, a lot of things to be done for this. So the total is that. Okay. Now at the end of the month, as a payroll officer, you want to, or the accountant who needs to post the payment of salary into the, the ledgers. This is what you should do to determine the total salary for the month. Total salary for the month against a company is the gross salary plus the 13% social security fund. Why do we say this? We say this because from the net salary, it is the same gross salary that we've taken some portion out of it giving us this net salary. So if you're not careful, you may think that the salary for the month is a 125,238, 233.8. No, it's not this. Because even though this is the total 
money going to all the employees. But the employer has to pay this SSF to snitch or to the fund managers. The same way, the employer has to pay this one to the union of the employees. The employer has to pay this to the Provident, Provident Fund Association. This has to go to internal revenue. So it means all these are payment on behalf of the employee. So therefore, the 13%, which doesn't come in as part of the employee's deduction, is going to be an additional payment the employer has to make in a, to the gross salaries. That is why we say that the total salary for a month is the sum of the gross salary and that of the total, that of the social security. Okay, so the total from the gross salary and the total of the 13% social security, when you sum them up, it gives you the total salary for the month. Payroll offices are also expected to prepare returns. To prepare the returns, this is what you do. You first of all sort out your customers according to the bank account they, the banks they operate with. If let's say three of them operate with, let's say, stand charge, stand charge, what you do is that you list the three people who operate with, who receive their salary through stand charge. Then you state their account number, their names, and their net salary. You put it on paper, print it out, and prepare a check to cover the total amount for the three employees. You accompany that sheet of paper you've printed with the check and it's forwarded to the bank. And the bank receives that, they'll be able to credit the employees with their share of the salary. At the end, you prepare similar returns to snitch, or yeah, to snitch covering the, the social security contribution. And for that one, you have to separate the tier one from the tier two. So you, you list all the employees, you list their SNIT numbers alongside, and you create a column for their tier one, a column for their tier two, so that you present that, um, or the college, you present that returns also to SNIT. You, pre you present another returns to in internal revenue, internal revenue authority, where you list all your employees, and then you state their income tax alongside them. Okay, so this is how, the various returns needs to be prepared at the end of the month. It tells you that when you finish payroll, that is not the end. You have to show up all the various returns and the returns will have to be done for every deduction that you have. So you, all the deductions, you show returns to cover them, okay? In addition to the net salary. So that is it for today. Um, if you are, learning and you encounter any challenge and you want to uh, get in touch with me, you can do so by sending mail to my email address, jamaframp at yahoo.uk.co.uk. .co.uk. There is another one to you, jamaframp at gmail.com. Or oh, you see my university address, latif.jfrempong at kstu.edu.gh. So any of these email addresses, you can send your comments to me. And uh, if you want to also reach me through WhatsApp, my WhatsApp line is 026, okay, let me make it 0260-939315. This is a Ghanaian line. So those of you who are outside Ghana, you have to add a Ghana code plus 233 to the to the number. So um, in our next recording, we shall look at how to generate payslip from Excel using from uh, payslip from this Excel payroll using Microsoft Word. So that is going to be our next lesson. Okay, I wish you well. Keep learning, please, my brothers and sisters. And contact me if there's any challenge. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.